Hey, y'all, welcome back to our Bible study today. And today we're going to deal with finding a new identity in Christ and how do we live that out? Now, I, we're in we're in first John and we're we're now starting in chapter three. So first John chapter three, and I'm going to start with verse one. And here's what it has to say. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Can I just pause right there? This whole idea of lavished on us. I, I, I want to I get that to you. The love of God is not sparingly dripped on us from an eyedropper. God does not take his love and, and, and give us just, you know, let me not give away too much. The love of God is poured out on us as if it were a five gallon bucket of water that's just being poured over the top of you. This is not something that's going to put drop on your head. This is something that's going to soak you all the way to the bone. This is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, God his love is lavished on us. He loves us so much. I, I really wish that I could get you to understand the depth, the breadth, the height of God's love for you because it is so huge. And that doesn't mean, y'all, stop. That doesn't mean there are no rules. That doesn't mean there's not a lifestyle required. We're going to get into some of that. But, but the truth is we got to start by knowing how much God loves us. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Listen to what he says. That we should be called children of God and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not been made known, has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Look. We must understand that the whole walk, when we're walking in the light of Christ, when we're walking in the light of the Holy Spirit, when we're walking in the light like this, we are walking in, hear me, a new identity. Anytime you are going to change your life, anytime you are going to make a massive change in the direction of your life, what you must do is you must take on a new identity. You cannot, listen to me, you cannot act in new ways while still identifying yourself with an old identity. The new ways require a new identity. I, I often say it this way, uh, when, when in, in July, July 2nd, 1988, that's a long time ago. I'm showing my age again. July 2nd, 1988, Tina and I walked into First Wesleyan Church in Kannapolis, North Carolina. When we walked in, we walked in as James Michael Hilson and Tina Sue Allen. We walked down the, down the aisle. The pastor said some words. He prayed over us and he turned us around and we were then introduced as Mr. and Mrs. James Michael Hilson. We took on in that moment, Tina and I took on a new identity. We took on a brand new, well, look, her, where did her name even go? You know, in that moment, she became Tina Hilson and, and, and I became husband. She became wife. We took on a new identity. It changed then the way we viewed the whole world around us. It changed the way we viewed every other individual around us. The world was, it was now, and I got to tell you, to this day, this is true. It's me and her against the world over and over and over and over again. Why? Because on that day, I took a new identity. Same thing happens when you come to know Christ. He has lavished his love on you. He has named you his child. You are no longer a loser from nowhere. You are now a child of a king who is serving a king, who is speaking a truth that cannot be maligned and cannot be, cannot be discredited because it is the truth of God. He has said who you are and whatever he says is true. If Jesus says you are a child of God, you are a child of God. You have changed. That new identity now changes the way you see the world around you. It changes the way you see the people around you. It changes the way you see yourself. And I think if I could get across to people in this world, the idea that, that, that what I am is, is different now than it was before I knew Jesus, then that would help us to begin to make the, 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 the progress we need to make in our spiritual lives. Look, if you pray a prayer and say, because I prayed the prayer, I'm saved, but you don't change anything about your lifestyle, you claim in the name of Jesus, but you're still living like the devil. I'm talking like the old preachers. I get it. But if you're claiming the name of Jesus, but still living like the devil, something's not right. You've not taken on the new identity because the child 
of a king is not going to crawl back up in the trailer park. Y'all all right? I'm just telling you. Now, I, 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 know, I know maybe that's only a southern phrase. The child of a king is not going to crawl back down into the slums. The child of a king is going to learn to live like the child of a king. And it's going to be different. It's going to be new. That's what God wants to do with you. The reason the world doesn't know us, the reason the world doesn't understand us, because it, it doesn't understand him. Remember, remember, he says in the last chapter, do not love the world or any of the things of the world. He, he says to you, the world is not going to get it. Why? Because the world has twisted, has, has, has distorted the things of God. The world is living in the lust of the eyes and in the lust of the flesh. We are living in the presence and the purity of the, of the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. We're living in a different place. We're living in a different way. And it should affect who we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is it didn't know him. It says we are children of God and what, listen to this verse, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. I want, I want to take this in two different ways. I want to take this temporarily uh, here on the planet physically. And I want to take this eternally. Uh, there in heaven because there's a here now and there's a there then and there's an outplay of both in this statement that what we what we will be has not yet been seen has not yet been made known listen no matter what age you are what you will be in the presence in the power in the redeemed life of Jesus having washed you clean and in the power of the of the Holy Spirit that's going to carry you forward what you will be in this life has not yet been seen I can tell you right now, I can tell you right now with no question whatsoever, what I was when I received Christ, when I finally surrendered to Christ at 16 years old, what I was then, and what I, I had no idea what God could do. If I had seen today, when I am now 58 years old instead of 16 years old, if I had seen today, then it would have overwhelmed me. What God has done, what God will do, what God will do, ah, Come on, what God will do in you in this life is beyond what you can now see. Trust Him with it. Trust Him with you. Trust Him with your life. Trust Him with your future. Trust Him with your direction. Because God has a plan for you that you can't even see right now. And nobody else can either. Nobody else can either. Nobody can believe what God will do in you if you allow Him. But there's also this other moment. There's also this other moment where there will be a there then. There'll be a, there'll be a time when we're in the presence of God in heaven. And what we will be then has not yet been made known. What we will be doing in heaven, how we will be serving God in heaven, what our eternity will look like. What Look, people say, well, it's streets of gold and it's gates of pearl. and it's Okay, hold up. Yes, true, true. All that's biblical, right? Here's what the author is actually trying to say. Take the most beautiful, amazing, incredible thing you can imagine for all of eternity. And it's better than that. Because what John is trying to do and what the other writers are trying to do, what Isaiah is trying to do in chapter 6, what all of these writers are trying to do is they are attempting to describe the indescribable because God is so much more than we could ever imagine. And when we see him, we will be like him. We have a new identity here and we'll have a new identity there. God will do great things. God will do great things in you. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be healthy, wealthy and wise and you're suddenly going to have a billion dollars in your checking account and you're going to be driving, you know, Rolls Royce. I, I'm not, that, that, that's so beside the point. God's going to make you into the most powerful version of who you are that you could possibly imagine. And that's what God wants to do in you. And that's how God wants to use you. He continues. He says, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Listen to what he says as he keeps going. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that, well, let me pause. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is, I, I have a definition of sin I want to give you. Sin is a willful transgression of a known law of God. Sin is when I know what is right and I do against it. I know what is right and I don't do it. Or I know what is wrong or, or, or I know what is right to do and then I do something else altogether. It is a known law. I know I'm making a mistake. I know I'm doing it. Even if it's for a split second, I know I shouldn't do this. How do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit is going to tell you. 
The Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. You're going to have this check in your spirit that says, don't do that. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is not surrendering to the voice of the Holy Spirit when he says, don't do this or do that, and I don't. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. In God, there is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Let me pause just a minute here. Because none of us are perfect, and so all of us fall down. But here's, here's what he's saying. No one who lives in him keeps up habitual patterns of sinful behavior. You don't do that. It does, it's not saying, he's not saying here that no one who, who lives in him uh, commits any sin ever. It's not like if you walk in the light, you live in Christ, you suddenly become perfect and you never mess up again. You never make a bad choice. You never fail to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is those habitual patterns of sin that we used to walk in, that we used to revel in, that we used to party in, those things now must stop because I'm walk, I've got a new identity. I'm not that guy anymore. I don't do that anymore. I don't act that way anymore. I don't live like that anymore. It's a new reality, and I don't stay in those habitual patterns. No one who continues to sin, no one who continues in habitual patterns of sin has either seen him or know him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous. You understand that's kind of a definition of the word. Righteous means one who does right things. Righteous means to do right things. So one who does what is, is right is righteous, just as he is righteous, just as God is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So listen to me. You either have a new identity that is in Christ or you're holding on to the old identity that is in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. You, 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 you get to choose. Here's the good news. You get to choose. If you choose Christ and forgiveness, you have a new identity. But that new identity, watch, that new identity, identity comes with new patterns. I have to change the way I live. I can't just be who I used to be. This is not, this is not, I used this phrase in church a few weeks ago. This is not me buying fire insurance that'll just keep me out of hell and I can live any way I want to, but I can't go to hell now because now I got to get out of hell free, free card from God. That's not what this is. The, the, this new identity comes with new patterns. Yo, if suddenly, let's, let's say tomorrow they come up and all of a sudden you're like king of the world and they do a DNA test and, oh, wow, you're king of the world. You're not going to act tomorrow the same way you did yesterday because now you got a whole new role. you got a whole new identity. you got a whole new thing you're doing. You're, you're, you're not the same. Okay, light and momentary and showing my age again. Way back in the day, they had this TV show called the Beverly Hillbillies. Well, the, the, they didn't believe that, that, uh, that uh, Uncle Jet should live in Arkansas, in backwoods Arkansas anymore because he was now super rich. So since he's rich, well, well, California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. You know, so the truth is that they, they thought he had to go somewhere else because he was now identified differently. Listen to me. When you are identified as a child of God, you come out of the backwoods of sin and you find new ways to live. You don't, you don't keep wallowing around in the swamps of what the devil has had you do. You find your way out of that and you live in a new place because you are now a child of the king. And the truth is, if you decide to do that, God will set you free. But that new identity requires a new pattern. If you try to stay in the old pattern, you're simply remaining as a child of the devil because he's been doing this from the beginning. So you've got a new identity that leads to a new pattern. Now watch, he goes on. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Look, I got a new identity. I got new patterns. And I got a new purpose, a new reason for living. My reason for living now is to, is, to, is to destroy the devil's work in me first. And then by living properly in the world around me, begin to destroy or at least frustrate the devil's work around me. And then it is also to continue to become more and more and more like Christ. 
I got a new purpose in life. Y'all, the rest of the world is out there just trying to get to Friday. They're just trying to make it through this week and get to Friday. Get to Friday, have a weekend to watch football and, and, and party and do what. They're just trying to get to Friday. They're just, they're just living their life. They're looking for any little piece of happiness they can find. Those of us who follow Christ, we, we have a different purpose. Our goal every day is to wake up and be in the presence of the Holy Spirit and each and every day do everything in our power to live better than we did yesterday but not as good as we'll be able to be tomorrow. Every day to walk in the light of Christ. Every day to walk in the Spirit of God. Every day to walk in the freedom He has given us. Every day to wake up and say, Father in heaven, thank you for naming me as your child. Today, Lord, as a child of the King, help me, teach me, empower me to act like who I am. All right, so let's jump right on into this discussion. I want to start right at the beginning of chapter three. See what love the great father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Then he goes in talking about, um, he, says, he actually says, and that is who we are. He's like, explanation mm -hmm. point, like right. just reminding you. Uh, I think it's always important to, I have to keep in mind who he's talking to, right? Mm -hmm. The circumstances are facing. We've been talking about it for each of these, the, the, the split that's happening in the church, the confusion that's happening in the church. I want to ask you in today's world, today's church, how important is it of this reminder that we are children of God and the fact that the world might not know you, the world might not recognize you, the world might look at you sideways. Um, and in your career as a pastor, how often have you had to remind people of that? Okay, two things. First of all, you read the sentence in wrong order, okay. though you did not change the veracity of it. You, 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 you said, <laughs> great love see, what, great father. see what love the great father, which is true, <laughs> which is true, and what great love the father. So, yeah. but, but the identity thing in my ministry, I have to tell you that over the years, identity is the key that unlocks how I act in the days that are in front of me. And, and I see this over and over again because I, I see people who have, who have accepted an identity, a label that the world has put on them. And because they accept that label, they act out in that label. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that from, uh, with, with children, for instance, when, when, when the school system, and look, sometimes diagnoses are, are good. Everybody hears me. Diagnoses are helpful at times. But oftentimes when a, when a system diagnoses a child as this or that or another thing. That child, if the parents are not careful, that diagnosis will become the identity of that child. Yeah. And that child will act out in that diagnosis. It will act out in that, in that, in that label and actually not find progress toward, toward recovery, but remain in the mm -hmm. label. Um, I see this in the church across the board. I, I, see, I see people, especially especially these dude you know okay i know i'm older than you guys i'm the old guy at the table i get that but but in my day you it was not okay to label people mm. i mean we did it don't get me wrong but we were we were stupid kids who were being mean mm -hmm. and we knew it was mean when we labeled people we we knew it was mean right today it seems like especially among kids and in the educational system it's not only acceptable to label people, it's not acceptable for you to have anybody in your world that's not labeled somehow. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it angers me because I see people, I, 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 have, I cannot tell you how many counseling sessions I've had to have in the past 10, 15 years with kids whose friends at school have labeled them as gay mm. because she might be a little more tomboyish mm -hmm. or he might be a theater kid and the kids at school have labeled them gay and they're believing what their friends told them. Yeah. And they just think, well, now I'm stuck in this. I can't get out. I can't do anything else about it. I might as well give into it. They are living inside their label. Yeah. If we could somehow get them to see you are a child of God. Did a whole book on this through the book of Nehemiah, mm. where we talked mm -hmm. about identity, taking authority over identity, because this, I think, is the core issue. Look, 
they'll trap you. We, we just finished, uh, not everybody will attach with this, but as of today, when we're sitting here, we just finished a presidential election. So they have decided if you are a Republican, you must be, and here's your list. Mm -hmm. If you are a Democrat, you must be, and here's your list. None of that's true. Yeah. Yeah. None of that's right. And yet somehow we are stuck in this thing where they're labeling people and saying, you have to act like this because you wear this label. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's just, y'all, the label we need to wear is the label child of God. I am a forgiven, blood-washed, spirit-filled, mm -hmm. walking in victory because my God is bigger than anything I can face. Child of the living God who is going to save me, carry me, sustain me, and bring me to heaven. Let's have an altar call right now. Yes, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. that's where we need to be. I, you, you, you pushed a button. I'm sorry. It was purposeful. Well, <laughs> I, I, love, I love talking about being being the children of God because you know when you look at as a child when you realize that you're the child of, of a particular person you look at that person and you can kind of know that's who I'm going to be yeah. you know and it mm -hmm. really hit me actually when I was like in my early 20s and I was thinking about my grandfather and I was like mm -hmm. man I really am kind of like the spitting image of my grandfather yeah. so I, I knew that that's my trajectory I can look and I can see that that's where I'm headed I'm going to become like this guy yeah. because it's who I am and that played into also who I wanted to be mm -hmm. because when I accepted who I was, it was like, okay, now I'm going to live into that. Yeah. And I love how he says that here in a way, because he says, we know that when Christ appears, we're going to be like him, mm -hmm. right? For we shall see him as he is. So there's a cool eschatological moment here. I had the hard time saying that word. Eschatological. Eschatological <laughs> moment here where like, tells us a little bit what, what's going to happen when Jesus shows up. Yeah. That in that moment, there will be some sort of transformation that will occur when he comes back, mm -hmm. which is kind of neat. And we could pause there and discuss that, but let me just get the point finished yeah. in that uh, we're, he we're going to look like Jesus. Not, just, not physically necessarily, like I was talking about with my grandfather, but our character, our yeah. heart, our purity, all of that, we're going to be transformed into this perfect version of ourselves that look like him. But then the next phrase says, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just mm. as he is pure. Mm -hmm. I think that's the teaching point. Yes. Yeah. The yes. teaching point is when you know who you are and you say this, right, it's mm -hmm. going to lead into these new patterns. Right. We should long to look like him. We should try to prepare ourselves to look like him. Right. It's not going to just happen to us like my hairline is going to happen to me because I'm my grandfather's <laughs> kid. And when it comes to the character of Jesus, he might transform us and finish the deal, yeah. but we're supposed to walk in this thing the whole way. Yeah. yeah see, and I think that's beautiful. See, I can give you the opposite story. I look, I act, I talk. My, my, my gestures are very much like my dad was. Mm. But I did not want to be that. Mm -hmm. he would, he, he, I, one of my goals in life, one of my life goals is to make, is to make everybody's life around me better than it was before they met me. Mm -hmm. I, my, my dad, and he's in heaven, he knows Christ and he, he did his best. You know, I need to say that I'm not, I'm not bashing, mm -hmm. but he tended to make everybody's life around him worse. Wow. And, and I, I had to overcome the fact I look like him, therefore I'm going to act like him. No, no. I'm a child of God. I'm going to, I'm going to work toward becoming like him mm -hmm. because I need to look like my God in heaven, not like my father. Yeah. So yeah. there's this beautiful promise in that mm -hmm. Jesus is going to do the work. There's another phrase that the apostle Paul says, he's like, you know, may the God of, may the, may God sanctify me completely dot, right. dot, dot. He will surely do it. Yeah. There's he this who promise. Began a good work in you will, will complete it will in the day of Christ. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. one uh -huh. Thessalonians, one See, Philippians. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful thing. But then there's this other phrase where it's like, you know, uh, in Philippians chapter two, it says, you know, the Lord will, um, <laughs> it says, may he do this work in you, you know, according to his pleasure. And then it says, for you're supposed to, you know, do the work, basically let, uh, work out your salvation with mm. fear and trembling yeah, yeah. for it is he who right. works in you to will and to work. I had to, it took me a second to get that one out of the, the dusty cobwebs. But <laughs> the point being is that it's this, you, you got this promise, it's going to happen, mm -hmm. yeah. but you also have to do the work. Yeah. You have right. to live into the identity. I love the, uh, as, as we're working into that identity, he gives some validity to the point that you're going to stick out. You're going to stand out. He says, the reason the world does not know us is because it did not know him. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And I love the, the little bit of validity he gives there to, yes, the church will be under persecution. You, I believe you went over in your last teaching where you said the gospel is going to be offensive, mm -hmm. right? right? Like there's right, going to be people right, right. that just don't agree with you. You can't people please. And we're not mm -hmm. trying to make anybody mad, but there's this idea that the, the world's not going to recognize what you're trying to do because mm -hmm. they didn't recognize what Jesus was trying to do. You know, here's the thing. When you're living in Christ and you're trying to walk in the light of Christ, you don't have to work at making the world mad. It ticks them Ooh. off already <laughs> just because just they see what's going on in you and you're yeah. improving you're moving forward. You're not being arrogant about it. If you're being arrogant about it, you're not becoming like Christ. Yeah. Because Christ, being God, being in very nature, God mm -hmm. did not demand, did not see equality with God as something to, to be demanding. Yeah. He took on the nature of a servant and, and even made it, humbled himself all the way to death. So it, we, we can't become spiritually arrogant, but we got to become spiritually better. Yeah. And when we do, that will tick off the world automatically because mm -hmm. they, they don't like that. Yeah, I remember... You know, switching gears a little bit, getting into the next passage, talking about anybody who breaks the law, in fact, is, you know, is in lawlessness. Um, this used to really scare me. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't think John's intending to freak us out all that much here, right? I no. think, I think what he's trying to do is give us a little bit of warning. What do you say to the new believer that reads this passage and is really struggling you know, in, in working through freedom. It's the reason I said it the way I did in the, in, in the teaching, which is this is not a one-off, oops, I tripped and fell. Mm -hmm. This is a habitual pattern of sin that you refuse to let yeah. go of. Mm. And when, when, when you have that, it stunts your growth. Mm -hmm. It stops you in your tracks because that's not what God meant for you. Mm -hmm. God meant for you to be changed, to be growing, to be, be becoming more and more like him every day. Yeah. yeah. And the only way that's going to occur is if you're willing to let go of those patterns of sinfulness, those patterns of, of lawlessness. Yeah. So I, I think that, again, it, it's the old phrase we've used so many times. Grace is huge, but holiness is required. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I oftentimes will tell people uh, there's a difference between struggling with sin and submitting to yes. it. Yes. Right. If someone's struggling with sin, there's a fight going mm -hmm. on and they're reaching out for accountability. They're taking the steps. And like you said, there may be a oops, I fell. Right. Mm -hmm. But you don't lay down in it and right. you don't identify with the back to identity. You know, it's not I am this sin. I am mm -hmm. this thing. Right. It's pastor, friend, small group leader, whoever. I'm struggling with this thing. Can you help me? Right. Right. And, and I love that because this this overarching teaching in First John that knowing Christ should change you. Mm -hmm. Like knowing the Father, having fellowship with the light should change you. Right. And it's this idea of, of no longer submitting to who you were, but struggling when mm -hmm. necessary and then overcoming eventually. Right. Mm. Right. I love the phrase where it says, because God's seed remains in them. <laughs> um, I don't think I remember that from anywhere else mm. in scripture, God's seed. What do you think... What do you think that analogy is trying to get across, particularly in this passage? Uh, let, let me let me take a shot at it this way. Some years ago, um, uh, and, and this is how I viewed the, the how God's seed gets in you and stays there. Mm -hmm. Is uh, some years ago, uh, a mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Wood, said to me, "Michael, I'm praying for you." And I said, "What are you praying?" He said, I'm praying that everything God is doing around you moves so largely and so quickly that you lose control. Mm. And I thought, dude, you need to quit praying for me. <laughs> <laughs> what he, wow. then, then he clarified. He said, because when you lose control, you can only ride what God is doing. Mm -hmm. And he said, and here's where I get to your point. He said, once you experience that once, you'll never be satisfied with anything else. Mm. I think that once people experience the joy, the lift, the lightness mm -hmm. that you feel when, when, when forgiveness is actually applied in your life, the seed of that remains in us. Mm -hmm. And even if we fall down, even if we mess up, even if we even if we struggle along the way, even I, I, I truly believe even if we try to leave, mm. then I think I think that seed of the Holy Spirit and that seed of redemption remains there and it grows. I think ultimately, uh, you know, the Bible says, do not, do not pray about a sin that leads to death. 
uh, but not all sin leads to death. And, and I, I think that's what we're getting at here mm-hmm. is that this is not a, you know, falling down is not a, is not a sin that's going to condemn you to hell. Right. Re- rejecting Christ, taking on the spirit of Antichrist and rejecting that he is the God that you need. He is. The, that's the one that leads to death. Mm-hmm. And what we've got to be careful of is that that seed always remains. And honestly, walking properly, walking in the light, living it out, working, struggling, doing our job is part of nurturing that new seed that's growing inside of us. I love that. Uh, what is the old phrase? There are two, there are two dogs at war within you, mm-hmm. a red dog and a white dog. And the question is, which one's going to win? And the mm-hmm. white dog is holiness and the red dog is all the sin. Which one's going to win? And the answer is the one you feed. Mm. That's good. You know, so <laughs> starting in uh, in verse 11, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another back to this. Right. He, yeah. he's, he's been saying this the whole time. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Man, that's that's heavy. Right. Mm-hmm. And he's repeating the words of Jesus when Jesus talks about uh, harboring hate in your heart and comparing it to murder. Right. Mm-hmm. But does this feel harsh? Uh, tell me tell me a little bit about how <laughs> how hate can can be compared to murder here. Well, Jesus does that, though. Yeah. Jesus did that. Did that. I think, by the way, I think you're jumping into the next teaching. But, um, I might be. You might be, but it's okay. We're going to go there anyway. Okay. Uh, but, I was going to yeah. tackle verse 10 anyway. That's all right. About loving one another. Jesus, I was gonna end there. Jesus does that. Jesus says, you've heard it said, do not murder. I tell you, I tell you do not hate. Do not get angry, he says. Mm. It's a very strong form of the word, word angry. But um, and what Jesus is getting at is if, if, if you avoid the anger, you'll avoid the murder. Mm. Mm. If you avoid the hatred, you'll avoid the murder. Yeah. So he's Jesus is always taking us back to root causes. That's good. And so I think here you get the same idea. Do not do not be like Cain, because Cain allowed that. Um, mm, what's the word I'm looking for? That jealousy. To to harbor. And ultimately it became, he allowed that jealousy, to, think about this, he allowed that jealousy to harbor in his heart to the point that, it, that in his mind, the reason God didn't like him was Abel's fault. Mm. The reason God rejected Cain was somebody else's fault. And anytime you're taking your own failures and you're blaming someone else for them, you're living in delusion. And so we see it a lot these days, but anytime you blame someone else for your own failures, you're living in delusion. He did, and he lived in delusion to the point that it drove him to murder. Wow. Yeah. So, so the where I, I was going to go is right before that. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or mm-hmm. sister. So yeah. by de facto, if we're his children, we ought to. We should be reflexively loving our mm. brother and sister. Let me change your word just slightly. We must. Yeah. Yeah, we have Not to. Not just we should, we should be. We must. And I know you meant it that way, but for their sake. Yeah, we must. can't help it. Yeah. That's what I mean. It should just be a, ref- a reflex. It's, it's, a, should be yeah. flowing out of us but as But even if kids. it's not reflexive with a certain person, because not everybody's as lovable. Mm. Certainly not. But if it's not a reflection, then it's got to be a discipline. Wow. It's not, if it's not a natural reflex, it's got to be a discipline. You know this well because you, you make me work out. So when I work out, very little of what I do in the gym is mm. reflexive. Mm. It's all discipline, <laughs> right? It, yeah. I mean, but once <laughs> so, you get moving, it's all there, man. But um, then that happens with some people. We, we have to, we must, we just must. Now, mm. didn't mean I got a vacation with them. But but at the same time, I've got to love them. You know, uh, I don't know who said it, but they were talking about how I think it might have been talking about the Nazis. I'll have to remember the person's name, but she wrote a book called what? Let's just go to the worst possible. The worst possible because I need to. Um, She talked about the uh, the, I I can't remember the name, but talking about evil. She was talking about this one particular guy. Corey Ten Boom. No, it's not Corey, but she was talking about this one nazi who escaped Mm -hmm. um germany and was later found and she reports on his trial some of our listeners probably know who i'm talking about but anyway she couldn't believe at how normal this person looked in the courtroom Mm -hmm. this guy who had committed atrocities and evils beyond anything we could imagine looked so normal Mm -hmm. and yet was a monster inside had done crazy things and she just talked about how terrifying it is that human beings are capable Mm-hmm. of such 
enormous evil and such enormous darkness. Um, and he's, it's just this language of children of God, children of the devil, you mm -hmm. know, and how our actions can kind of bear out. We have the potential within all of us to be as heinous as Hitler, as terrifying mm -hmm. as that is, um, but also as loving as Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. And it's just a question of what we're going to choose. You know, mm -hmm. whose child are we going to be? Who the, are we looking forward to being? What's the old phrase? But by the grace of God, there go I. There go I. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. Corey Ten Boom tells us a similar story of speaking, um, and and a and a guard that she remembered mm -hmm. walks up to her at the end and just in tears begins to ask forgiveness and her mm. processing this monster mm. in her mind. Yeah. That's now standing in front of her as a broken man asking mm -hmm. for forgiveness. Yeah. And could she forgive him? I mean, I, I got to tell you, somebody hurt our feelings because they said something bad. Mm -hmm. And we're wondering if we can forgive them. You need to go to stories like that. You know? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. she did ultimately forgive. Yeah. This, the yeah. one I'm thinking about is not a Christian lady. I think she might have been Jewish. It might, it might be the banality of evil by Anne Rand, maybe, or something right. like that. Uh -huh. I can't remember if that's her, but... That's where I was drawing that story yeah. from, but that one's more powerful because Corey did forgive. She did. Yeah, she did. And she, she said she couldn't. Forgive. She couldn't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. She really yeah. gave credit to Jesus Christ. And there's, yeah. um, there's so many, there's so many examples of that throughout history. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if you remember, but this guy that went in with a gun into an Amish community and killed all these kids in the, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. in the school, and then killed himself. Um, uh, the the Amish community, in their pain in their mourning, stood up and, and stated their forgiveness for him because he was a human being broken by sin. Wow. Amazing. Stunning stuff. I mean, I, I, I hope, I, first of all, I hope I never get to test that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I would hope I would be able to forgive like that. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'll, I'm just going to be real about it. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. So, but. But it's possible within us each of us, that capacity yes. exists. Mm -hmm. It does. And we can feed one or the other. Which yep. dog are you going to feed? <laughs> <laughs> Good point.